Hi, and welcome to Modeling a Juggling Robot. This is a video presentation based on my master thesis. Unlike my official presentation of my master thesis, this will focus less on the research and more on the implementation and presentation. The Juggling Robot project, JERP, is as of now an ongoing project within KDH Mechatronics. The purpose is to develop a juggling robot to be used as a research platform. In 2018, a team of eight students, who I was one of, designed a prototype for a juggling robot called JERP 2018. This presentation will touch on JERP 2018, but will focus more on the further implementation of digitalizing the system. The constructed prototype works in closed loop, meaning that its motion and behaviors are reactive to the environment unlike open-loop systems, where the control does not use feedback. The background of this project is not to optimize the circus industry. It is, as stated before, to develop a viable research platform where different mechanics, electronics, software and control algorithms might be tested. Since the model is digital, it provides an ideal simulation environment and also has the benefit of easily changing small parts of the simulation. The other great aspect is funding. A juggling robot has a certain coolness factor to it. It is a system that requires high movement and high precision, and is a good way to show off what the department can do. From a research point of view, the main goal is to improve execution time, but this is mostly covered in the report and will not be brought up here. The system in question, or the robot, is a 5 degree of freedom fully serial mechanism. The first three degrees of freedom determine the position of the end effector. The last two are to rotate the end effector, so it always stays leveled with gravity. The control of the robot is divided into a high level and low level control. The purpose of the high level controller is to figure out the optimal path for the end effector to reach the desired position, and from that trickle down references to the low level controller. The low level controllers are positional controllers, and they realize the motion of the high-level controller. And the control loop starts with the ball position, which is recorded by a Vicon camera system. Then the ball position is sent to the high-level controller. The first step of the high-level controller is the ball trajectory estimator. It tracks the ball position and the path of the ball to estimate its trajectory. From that, it figures out the desired position. In other words, where the ball will land. The desired position is then sent to the Inverse Kinematics Linear Quadratic Regulator, shortened LQR here. Its purpose is to produce a reference for the low-level controllers by taking the desired position of the end effector and the current arm configuration. The current arm configuration is used with forward kinematics to calculate its current end effector position. So when the current position and the desired position is known, an optimal path is calculated using a modified levenberg marquardt method. It quickly generates a series of references, which becomes the path the arm takes from point A to point B. The series of references is then continuously pushed down to the low-level controllers, which in turn realize the motion path. The low-level controller uses a PVM signal to control the joint angle of a specific joint. The joint angle is determined by the reference and the series of references it gets from the high-level controller. The same low-level controller is duplicated to each joint, with some modified parameters. Now that the robot is actuated and moves in a desired manner, hopefully the end effector manipulates the ball position again, which is recorded again, and then the loop is closed. So a good place to start within projects like this is the CAD. And for this, I'm using Solid Edge due to its availability. And there are some obvious benefits to why you want to use a CAD software. Like for example, it's to check so that all the fittings sit correct, so you know how to mount the whole thing, and so that you can check that all the parts that you want to make are manufacturable. And then another benefit is obviously also the way you can check that the movement is intended. 
and so that the whole system can move kinematically how we expect it to and so that everything seems feasible and it's also a graphical illustration of what the, the final thing might look like when everything is put together so next thing we want to do is to export all of this to simulate MATLAB and unfortunately as of this version you can't really export the whole model as one structure to Simulink. However, you can take individual parts. Or in this case, you can take parts and group them together. So parts that are rigid in relation to each other, like for example, this uh, mount for the motor and the motor can go into one Simulink export. Since they're not moving to each other and their weight is relatively similar, it's perfectly fine. Now one exception that I'm going to make is the motor, because the motor is heavy from steel and so on. Uh, and this mount over here is made of aluminium with some uh, speed holes. So therefore the motor is going to be an individual part. So what's done, it's, it's everything grouped, so everything up here is one part. The mount with the motor is second. Motor third mount down here fourth. 5th and 6th part, one for each degree of freedom. And why and why everything is exported in these partials is because we want to recreate everything in, in Simulink and for that we don't want to like pick every nut and bolt and replace them because that will just uh, add a lot of complexity to the system without contributing too much. It's all based on the assumption that everything from this assembly will hold and that uh, nothing will break from the weight. And also when creating something like this, be sure to use as much standards as possible when it comes to uh, bolts and nuts and so on. So everything is exported as step files. So I'm going to go into Simscape and Simulink to show how it looks from there. Every Simulink Simscape model needs to start with something in the likes of this. So a solver configuration, a mechanism configuration, and a world frame. This more or less just sets the initial rules for our simulation. I'm going to start with the rigid transform, but it's just to rotate the first part so it's lined up accordingly, which comes in over here. So here is this, uh, the shoulder motor, that's the imported step file. So you export from Solid Edge or your CAD software chosen as either step or STL and then you can import it like this. Now another part to add is to include the density for the part or you could also choose the mass if you know exact mass of the part. And from here we can't really just push all the other parts in the exact same spot. It'll probably mess up the whole system. So what's needed to be done is to do different transforms and then we have we need to figure out the, the required transformations to place all the joints in the correct spaces. Now in this system every joint is a rotational joint. So these connections marked in grey are the physical connections. Now the first joint is defined. To place the upper arm in the correct spot, we need to do the inverse transformation. So this transformation is basically the reverse transformation of this one. And soft up like this, the both parts would behave as intended. So the joint is in the correct place, and also the transformation is in the correct place. So by doing this, the rotation gets to the correct place in the first transform and then so that the translation comes in the correct space, we need to get back to our position. Now this may vary depending on how you save all your step files and where the origin is related to that. And it might require some trial and error before you figure out, but usually within CAD software you can find the exact distances to the ground. 
And then the same concept is added on to the all to the upper arm, the elbow, and so on. So now that we have all the joints connected and all the correct parts, then we have our mechanics completed. So now that the basic mechanics are completed, the next step is to get inputs to the joints. And that is done by adding actuation and then provided by input. And also we can either have actuation by torque or motion. If we have motion then it's a kinematic model, torque then we have a dynamic model, which is more often the better case. And torque is produced by some form of electricity, some motor in the case. And the motor in this case is a is a simple little block diagram. And this block diagram is derived from the basic motor equations and is solved for torque. And the input is voltage. So now that we have voltage for the motor, we can control it by motor. And since we can, from the joint, pick sensing and also sense our velocity and position, from that we have our feedback gain. So we can have our controller. So to control this, we want to control the voltage supply to our motor. And we also have the feedback gain from our shoulder joint where we can sense position, velocity, and acceleration. And then we have a feedback loop. And to control it, a PAD block is used. And then the same thing is duplicated over all of the three joints over here. And there are also two for the end effector, but I might not get too much into that since it's a separate system that's not uh, as interesting right now. The input for the lower level controllers or the reference is defined as the input for this specific subsystem. Where this subsystem is the plant of the robotic arm. Now that we have basic electronics and basic mechanics, we can go to the somewhat finer mechanics. And in this case it's a library that's called SM contact force library. And the library includes all simple collisions. So over here it's the sphere to And luckily enough a uh, sphere to cone force is included in the library. So copying that and implementing it on the and on our endpoint and then also to a 6 degree freedom joint. Now this is not a real 6 degree freedom joint. It's more or less just a way to sense the position of the end effector between our ground and the end effector. So just imagine that there's a 6 degree freedom joint but between our origin and our end effector. It doesn't really provide anything to the system. With the robot being able to go to the desired position based on our angles we give to it, you can think about the high level control. So the purpose of the high level control is to figure out how to move. Now we can give individual angles to each motor, but we can't, as of currently, tell it to go to x, y, and z coordinate. You can just say uh, theta 1, 2, and 3 for the angle of each joint. The second part of the problem is to figure out what path to take to that part. Now there are many solutions to the inverse kinematics problems and we want to find a specific one. And lastly there is also the software flowchart of what to do in which case. In the specific case of a juggling robot, sometimes you want to throw, sometimes you want to catch. So you have to differentiate between the two and know which one to do when. Now from before we have our system plant which might give out the state vector, that is the recorded uh, like joint position, 
the angles of a joint. We can track the ball position with the Vicon cameras. And what we want to give back to the system plant is the reference angle for each joint. So in the high level control, we want to figure out what to do. Now in hindsight, I notice that this chart is maybe a bit poorly made, but the main point is to ask if we are catching or not. Now if we catch, then we want to run first a trajectory estimator that is figuring out where the ball will land based on the position that we get, or rather the series of positions. And then when we need know where to get, then we can run the control to figure out a decent path to that location. And if we're catching in this case, it's just a ball throwing script that's a hard-coded scripted throw. And then depending on like pattern and so on, the script might look very different. But for now it's just a hard-coded throw. Now the implementation within Simulink is to use MATLAB function blocks. And the MATLAB function blocks are more or less just a MATLAB function that runs periodically every given time frame. The MATLAB function blocks are then translated from MATLAB code to C code, which is then run as a simulation within MATLAB. With all the components put in place, we can check how it looks and performs. From a mechanical point of view, we see that all the parts are moving somewhat as expected. There is no obvious clipping, all the joints seem to be in the correct places, and also the inertia of each part seems to make sense. Now the electronics aren't as obvious in this one, but they seem to do their job with actuating it dynamically rather than kinematically. To further investigate the electronic aspect, I would recommend to check in the Simulink model and to check at the graphs produced from there. One part of the mechanics that might have an issue is the collision. So we can see it sometimes clips through a bit, and also the ball doesn't entirely roll down in the center of the cone at all times. And the high level and low level controls seem to work really well together. The high level control generating the references for the low level control and the low level control following it. The robot has clear stages of throwing and catching and seems to be executing good enough at least. The video presentation is mostly focused on the implementation and the general presentation. For more detailed explanation of everything and also the research aspect of the project, everything is included in the report that hopefully will be linked somewhere. The code and the model is appended within the report, but will also be uploaded to GitHub, hopefully. That's all for now, and I might upload an update later. Happy engineering!